Now we move on to our fireside chat on building a culture of innovation, fostering early adoption mindsets and organizations. And our speakers are Sai Santana Krishnan, Senior Privacy Risk Manager at Amazon, Ragwa Gopal, CEO of M Square Media, and Ruchira Chakaborty, founder and CEO of Coach Koji Private Limited. Please give them a round of applause. Good evening, everyone. Um, it's wonderful to see you guys here. And the topic is very interesting. We have uh, building a culture of innovation, fostering early adoption mindset and organization. Um, it's a very interesting topic, so I'll start with myself. Uh, being in tech for about over two decades, it's very interesting to see how innovation has happened from the times when we had uh, our Y2K to where we are today. We were talking about AI a few sessions ago. So innovation has come a long way. So given that, it'll be very interesting to understand how do you kind of cultivate that? How do you motivate folks to adopt to a, you know, a mindset of trying new innovative uh, technologies? Um, how can we solve business problems using innovation and you know, a set? And how do you foster that culture within an organization? So I would like to welcome my panelist, uh, Ruchira, as well as uh, Raghav. Please introduce yourself. Thank you, Sai. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to introduce myself very, very briefly. My name is Raghav Gopal, as I said. I'm currently the CEO of MSM, M Square Media. It's an ed tech company. We do uh, international uh, educational services, providing education to anybody that wants uh, anywhere in the world. Prior to that, uh, I was uh, working uh, for the state government of British Columbia, running the innovation uh, department. And prior to that, uh, for about 40 years, I have been an entrepreneur running my own business. Uh, and it started um, just by fluke. I came uh, from Fiji, uh, settled in a small town in British Columbia, close to Vancouver, where there was zero opportunity for me as a software engineer to do something. So I had to get very, 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 very innovative and start my own uh, software company. So that's how I got into entrepreneurship. And, and I think very much that there was no opportunity at that time because it gave me a really good uh, uh, career path. So thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, I'm Ruchira. I, uh, in this incarnation of my life, I am an executive and leadership coach. And in my previous incarnation, I have uh, worked with uh, technology organizations, product organizations. I've le led them at various capacities in terms of uh, operations, in terms of HR and uh, the product space as well. And uh, it makes me very happy to be able to uh, speak on the matter of culture, growth, innovation, and uh, all, of the, all of those lovely things is because uh, I'm somebody who has moved from the sciences to the arts in my uh, career span. So I've moved from uh, being in the hardcore technology space to moving as what happens to people behind the scenes who make these changes happen. So that's, uh, that's my uh, introduction. Thank you. That's my background. I think that's awesome. That's a key story to start off with. So what drove you to kind of move from being hardcore technologists to, you know, to the people aspect of it? Because I think that's what culture is all about. When you look at, you know, the organization of a culture, I think it's so essential. And you seem to be doing that job right now. Uh, what drove me? It's not one thing. But I have always been working with people in, in, in capacity of uh, building organization capacity, building mindsets, building people to think about uh, what is next, next on the platform technology front. Like I said, I work with product organizations, right? 
So one thing that, is, that keeps even product organizations uh, awake is uh, what is coming next? What is on the next frontier? What would our customers want? So it is a lot more than only being able to service them. It is, it is that space in the gray to look out for that what isn't there yet that might be able to help them, not just uh, what's missing from a point of view of servicing. And that is, that is a, a way of thinking. It's an attitude the organizations either have or don't have. And that having or not having of that attitude itself is the culture. So how do you move the needle? What, what techniques do you recommend to your leaders? It's, again, I think it's very important to bring forward the point that, that there is a cognitive element with which all of us identify ourselves. All of us want to be in the know. That's why at one stage, like in the world wars, information, information, communication only meant information. Having access to information was important. Uh, the then uh, uh, the commander in chief of uh, of uh, France when uh, Second World War was happening was very uh, uh, absolutely categorical in terms of his hiding place, because he said if uh, if. Germany or, or any of the, any of the uh, uh, you know, uh, parties find out where he is located, then that would be the end of their military game. Unfortunately, what happened is not being available to his people, not being available uh, to coordinate the military strategies that are changing every minute, every second, every nanosecond on the field, on the battlefield, that's why he lost the war. It's no different for us. <coughs> It's no different for us. So these, these product organizations that are constantly, and people, let's move from organizations to people. We are talking about people here. So the cognitive element from information has certainly moved to knowledge. Google bought the knowledge space to us. It absolutely opened up, even before the generative AI that we are talking about, and AI this and AI that. We are no longer in the information and knowledge era at all. And knowledge also today has, has been commoditized. That's how Google rankings are happening. That's how page rankings operate. So now if there is somebody who automates the content space, which was so sacred for all of us. Mm -hmm. So if the cognitive is being ruled by machine learning algorithms, then what is the space left for humans? And that is the effective, that is the behavioral, that is what we feel in our emotions, and what part of us is giving birth to uh, those emotions or the, the creativity that goes in early mindset adoption of innovation. So what holds us back or what propels us forward? And that is the conversation around people and culture that's most important, at least I believe, to, to address. Raghav, how would you like to add? I think you've seen generation yeah. of innovations based on what we were talking about, uh, you know, where you said just now that you created your own space for getting into technology. In a town, there was no technology. And today, you're leading British Columbia's, you know, technology innovation space and strategization of that for a huge government space, correct? So it's, it's a long journey. So how do you see that, you know, uh, change happening, the drivers, the adoption? So what do you see there? Yeah, I'm just going to pick up on what Ruchira mentioned on the culture side and, uh, you know, me, myself personally, you know, my personal experience in, in, in building companies and companies where we had an innovation culture right from the get-go. And, and it was not just by accident, but it was by design. And there were certain things that I learned over the time over running multi building multiple companies that, uh, that I can pass on. But what I, the last five years has taught me, you know, when I went out and worked for the government and we worked with about 2,000 uh, companies, you know, mid-sized, early-stage companies for, to the companies that were growing, some of them were, you know, had a very good innovation culture. Uh, most of them were struggling, especially the public sector side were very, very behind. And, and we, I did a try, try to understand, like, what are the differences? What's the reason why, you know, some companies in the private sector that are small that are very uh, quick to adopt, 
uh, you know, innovation and, and build that culture and others that are doing fairly well and growing. So what do you see the difference uh, is or what the drivers are for one company being able to adopt more quicker um, yeah. versus another one? What's holding them back? I think it's, it starts from the leadership. I think if the owners or whoever the leaders of the company are, if they really understand the benefits of innovation, what I, that's what I found. If they, if they can understand and value those uh, points, I think they are much more open to, to you know, set aside the barriers that are holding them back to being an you know, innovative company and creating that culture and actually help put you know, things together that uh, helps uh, build that innovative culture. So the, th the three things that I found is, Innovation helps a company become competitive. And today in this you know, world where you know, everybody is so competitive, every company needs to really f you know, fight for customers and revenue, a bit of an advantage through innovation can really propel you and, and put you in a different scale. That's number one. Second thing is it definitely adds to the bottom line. So it, it does bring you know, better profitability. So if, if, if the leaders start to see that, I think they will start to uh, embrace innovation and, and, and build that culture. The third thing that's very important that's hardly talked about is in an innovative company, it's much easier to retain personnel. So good people that you hire, that takes a lot of time, a lot of energy to bring them on, train them, and, uh, and to keep them, it, there's good value. If they leave, it's a, it's a huge expense, right? So com people, good people, Bad people you don't care about, but you want them to leave, but good people that you want to retain, they actually love working for a company that actually you know, has that you know, innovation mindset, innovation culture. So those are the benefits, and leaders and companies and organizations that can understand that will definitely embrace innovation. Good, very good points from both of you all. From what I've seen in my own um, experience is that we've seen, you know, organizations that are willing to take risk, which are willing to have failures become positive successes. I think those companies actually innovate more quicker and more often. So people as, as a set are willing to take that bet to say, hey, can I solve a new problem? Can I look out in a new domain? Can I solve somewhere in a new region? Um, can I look at a certain vertical? Can I apply something that I've applied in one vertical across to another vertical? So I think will, people are starting to willing to take a bet and then you start seeing innovation because then we have to say, hey, maybe the problem fits about 75%, right. correct? And then we have to tweak it for, you know, for a region, for instance, correct? A lot of our banking applications. For instance, um, I remember like we would build it, build it and launch it in US and then we would take it to the Asia Pac market but then we have so many regulatory aspects of it right. and we would not be able to launch it. And that's where we start saying, hey, what can we do better? And that, that's a learning. So instead of like, you know, condemning that, but if you take that as a success story and you know, encourage that, I see innovation happening more. Uh, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Correct. So from a perspective of, you know, you've played in both the public sector as well as, so you're playing in the public sector and you are, you know, an entrepreneur yourself. So what would you advise for an entrepreneur, somebody who wants like a smaller, mid-sized business, if they have to take the journey of innovation? What would you say? You know, how would you encourage them? I, I think there's good learnings now and I'd, I'd just kind of focus on three things, you know, to, to help start to build that culture. Number one, is allow people the freedom to hack. So that's a very important thing. And actually encourage them, not just allow, but actually encourage them. You know, Friday afternoon beers, get together, and just try and, you know, instead of playing you know, table tennis or whatever, uh, ping pong, you know, uh, why don't we let's just hack on, on some issue or some challenge that the company has. And that starts to build that culture of starting to th think openly. That's one thing that worked really, really well uh, for me. The other thing that was the most beneficial that over the many companies that I've built and grown was actually in, intently, what we call it a container, you can call it anything. We found the best place in the office, the, the best office that had the best view, and we designated that as our innovation space. So that was a space that was designated for anybody in the, in the organization to go, you spend as much time over there to think out of the box, and try different things out, you know, prototype, try, break it, all of that kind of stuff. And what you'll see, you know, one person goes there, starts to do something, somebody else comes in, starts to question, 
and then all of a sudden you'll see a team working. But allowing them that, first thing, you know, creating that environment, um, and then allowing them to do that without uh, you know, questioning uh, really, it really helps. But when the company, that was when the companies were small. When the company grows, you start to lose a lot of that. And what we did very intently as well, intentionally, was uh, building in the job description for every job that we hired, 80%, everything that we wanted them to do as their regular job, it was defined as 80%. And we said 20% is for think out of the box. That was your innovation time. So every day, they almost had an hour or 45 minutes to do things. If they wanted to bank that and, and take a Friday and just hack, they had that. So it was kind of pushed right from the top. From the top, And, top. and okay. the very first day the you know, employees start in the organization, they get into that mindset, get into that culture, right? So you always see good ideas coming up. I'm Those seeing you're setting the things. tone at the exactly. top, correct? So you're saying setting the tone and the culture, yeah. and you're in becoming very, it's a part of the integrated culture of the organization itself. Okay. So I think those are very good value mechanisms that I see. From your perspective, um, uh, Rajira, you see leaders who have to, we have to change mindset, correct? We're talk, talking about setting the tone at the top, and you are working as a coach to kind of, kind of imbibe that value into them. And in your journey as a coach, what have you seen that? How have you kind of changed or helped them or enabled them to have this mindset? Uh, with my journey as a coach, I, when I come across leaders, when they talk about innovation, it never comes as a subject that I'm sitting here with you and, and the subject is innovation. So how, how are we then working as coaches? How are we uh, serving the innovation mindset with leaders without directly talking about them? They come up in the form of problems. Okay. They come up in the form of where leaders are stuck, with what is it that they are trying to achieve that they are stuck. Mm -hmm. So almost always the opportunity is in the space of stuckness. Mm -hmm. If they are stuck, which means that this is a problem, you know, people at N minus one, N minus two, N minus three levels are not being able to solve. And interestingly, that is when a lot of systems thinking perspective becomes important. Because if it's stuck at this level, solution will not come from the same level. So how do you help leaders scale their mindset? How do you help them integrate impact, which is not visible at the first degree level? Possibly, maybe it is at the second degree, but most certainly at the third degree level. How do you help leaders alleviate their level of thinking so that they see the second and third degree impact? Sometimes when a, they don't see impact at all. It becomes very clear and obvious that that's not a part to be taken. And sometimes the answers become so clear and so vivid because they're able to see through the patterns. They are able to see uh, what is being positively impacted and, and what is having a grotesque second, third degree impact. Clarity of action comes from there. What also happens with a lot of these leaders is that, that they realize that their own willingness is biases. getting in the way. Their own biases are coming into the way of innovation. Yes, That's so they very... will, they strongly will it, you know. But it's almost as if it's a physical power, physical force. But you know that you cannot roll physical power into a big boulder and, and push it down the mountain. It just doesn't happen like that. So a lot of the beautiful work that we do uh, with leaders, that the opportunity that is around mindsets is, is understanding where leaders themselves are stuck. That's, that's very, very critical what you said. The biases that we bring to the table, I think, prevents from innovating itself because we have a, si a set mindset, we are looking at set outcomes that we are not willing to take the path untraveled. Um, I think that's very, very important for us to kind of break those biases to kind of move forward. Um, given what you've said, do you encourage leaders to kind of collaborate you know, cross-mingle with their ideas so that innovation is more um, driven by, I would say, a more community base. Like, uh, a good example is, I would say, like when I was in 9-11, it's the time of 9-11, uh, when we had all our data centers under the, you know, the World Trade Center, um, how are we kind of looking at 
leadership kind of to look at it like, hey, we are using common grids. It's not just technology leaders, but we were looking at people who are supplying, you know, the grids itself. You know, we were looking at policy making. We were looking at uh, businesses, uh, whether it was telecom, whether it was, um, you know, financial sector. So I think we were forced to come together as leaders to solve a problem. Yeah. But I think that was a forced, it was a, you know, it's not the best of the situation for us to come together, but on an ongoing basis, how do we do that, correct? Because I think that's where innovation gets truly born. When we are willing to share, when we are willing to take somebody else's work um, and you know, integrate into our own knowledge um, and then move forward, I think that serves um, the space of innovation much better. So any personal examples, any use cases? Uh, absolutely, I think collaboration is important and sometimes it just uh, happens because one organization is doing something that has some relevance on another organization. I'll give you one example of uh, you know, one of my staff uh, sitting uh, or standing in front of a, a big Xerox uh, photocopier you know, seeing uh, one of our admin staff, you know, scanning all of these, you know, letters and correspondence that uh, that we've got from uh, from customers. And the question that he asked is, "What are you going to do?" And then he said, "I'm going to actually file this, you know, so when somebody asks, uh, uh, we'll, we can easily look it up." And he said, "Hmm, let me see if I can connect this as you scan automatically into your ERP system." And uh, that way, it just eliminates all of the manual work and the storage and all of that. And um, but that required him, you know, a lot of uh, you know, doing legwork on trying to figure out how Xerox machines work. But eventually, me, us, collaborating with with Xerox to be able to for us to write some machine code, inserting into that particular box that actually sent some data to our ERP system for an electronic um, you know, filing. But that's the collaboration that has to happen between organizations. And they were very, you know, we became competitive with our ERP systems, uh, and it helped uh, Xerox you know, create another solution just because of the partnership. So partnerships are always very important. Wonderful, that's a good. Do you have any use cases that you want to share? I think my bigger use case come from a variety of uh, leadership cohorts that uh, I have, uh, you know, run and the observation that comes from there. And my biggest observation now and has been for the last uh, half a decade, last five years, has been that people are enjoying community-based learning. So it's not necessarily so much as collaboration. It is each person bringing their own story, their experience to bear, and everybody is willing to listen from experiences and learn from that. And those somehow tend to shift people, they somehow tend to move people because the emotive is there. It is not mechanical, it is not technical, it is not skills based, it's not just ability based, it's so much more deeper than that. And that form of learning and then that's when senior leaders come together, so much more um, Powerful partnerships can be leveraged, right? So what we see, for instance, I work a lot in, um, in the African region, and one thing that stood out for me while working with these leaders is that, that they do not, share, do, do not shy away from sharing. And that's sharing of information, sharing of, hey, I went to a great course, hey, I went to a great conference, hey, I made, made, met this person, and, and, and I believe this person has a lot to teach us. Maybe we can all, all, all uh, make someone comfortable. So that is my experience that the world leaders are also operating, operating in, in, in that fashion, which is why a lot more bodies, international bodies are becoming a lot more powerful. So it's today is not just the United Nation, it is not just the G7 nations, it is not just uh, uh, the NATO uh, uh, you know, group of bodies that are being powerful. In, in small ways and big ways, a lot of establishments are coming together, their leaders are coming together, and there's a force multiplier effect that's happening when these leaders come together. So that is the power of partnership. Ideas are coming up from there. Uh, new solutions to old problems are generating when, when top minds meet. So yeah, that's my experience. I think that's, that's very, um, you see that in a lot of aspects, correct? Because we are seeing open uh, AI right yeah. now, adoption of code. Uh, GitHub is a, another uh, in a, a yeah. good example where 
coders and developers are willing to kind of share that code. And I think in the previous conversations, we were talking about how we were writing authentication for each bank individually. Yeah. But today, it's like a plug and play. So I think uh, that mindset has definitely come a long way. And it's kind of helping us to propel forward to solve more problems. Uh, have you seen from a regional aspect uh, where innovation could be a problem because of certain way cultural you know, uh, frameworks are set up or you know, regulations are set up? Um, I think that'll be a very good point for us to kind of look into because I think that also kind of impacts the culture of uh, innovation in many ways. Well, very good question. Actually, as Ruchira was talking about her working in India and Africa region, that same thought came to my mind was to ask you if, uh, if there are geographical differences in terms of what you see in, in, in terms of you know, innovation or, or even the culture of innovation. But uh, uh, from, uh, from my uh, experience, uh, especially in North America, uh, you know, there is so much help for uh, individuals and entrepreneurs and organizations if they want to uh, innovate. There's so much resources uh, out there to help. So I think we, uh, not knowing uh, other parts of the world and not having that kind of experience, I think North America is probably one of the, the top places uh, you know, where we are able to innovate only because of you know, all the resources that are available. But I, but I want to listen to you because you've done some work around those different areas uh, to see if you see any, any differences in, say, India or Africa or, or is it all the same? The intentions are very strong, Raghav, wherever I've been, the intentions of leaders are very strong. I think what, what gets in the way is just that um, there's still a certain degree of lag. There's a, just a little bit of lag, which is only a matter of time that, that, that world regions will catch up, right? Because the ideas are there, the intentions are strong, the, the will and willingness both are, are very powerful. And, uh, and the closer the world communities come together, the stronger the spokesperson and people are, the stronger the, the use cases that are built and spoken of, mm -hmm. that creates awareness, generates awareness. I think these bridges will, will, will become smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, just to add to what you guys both said, I think the aspect of risk taking is very important. Um, enabling uh, communities or demographics that are normally not touched in. Um, I was reading a quote, I think it came from Africa itself, where we said you enable a grandmother in a village and you actually enable an entire village. <laughs> and there has been MBA use cases that have been proven to that. Um, and I think we've done that in India too, correct? Uh, going digital, uh, digital in such a short time. I mean, now we have hawkers to you know, somebody who's delivering milk, everybody's asking for GPA, they're okay with it, yeah. correct? But when it first was introduced in India, I think we were all questioning the political aspect of it. Is it going to work? Is innovation going to be there? Yeah. And I think there is a digital India today, even going on, on the side of, you know, you go to the rural areas of India, everybody's so digitally savvy, and it had nothing to do with us all having an IT degree or you yeah. know, anything of that. I think so willing to take the bet uh, by a leader, I think is very important. And having that vision, I think, is very, very critical for us to kind of drive the culture of innovation. Um, I would say that. That's a great case study to take uh, 1.4 billion people and, and leapfrog them you know, to all the first world countries in terms of uh, technology and digitization. That's, that's amazing. That could be a great use case. <laughs> no, I study. think it is. It's a live use case that I think all of us are living who have left India have come here, I think that is a phenomenal use case that we all should learn from, correct? And it's again the community base, like how she was saying, yeah. enabling a community. And I think Amul is a great example of that, correct? Um, Just in Time is a great example right. of it. Our Dabba Wallers are a great example of it. So I think there are many use case stories that we can actually leverage in, into this because there are like, I think COVID was another example yes. where we had little children innovating, you know, uh, places where you can wash your hands or, you know, have uh, dispense uh, sanitizers and things like that. And we've seen so many WhatsApp videos all over. And young children getting into the field of innovation, I think it's also the push 
when there is, you know, there's a need and there is a thirst, I think innovation happens from that perspective. Yeah, and especially when there's a pain, right? I mean, you could, right. you could take two ways. You can just keep uh, doing over, go over that pain over and over again, or you want to do something about it. And the only way you're going to do something about it is to uh, change it, which is, you know, innovating in a different way. So, you know, a pain points also, also brings out innovation. So I can see why so much innovation uh, came across uh, when they were, you know, Tamil in the world. Um, I think the piece that I want to uh, borrow from what you just said, Sai, is about the role government plays as a matter of fact, right? And, and Raghav, you've been with the government uh, advisories directly. So there's a change model. We know the Kuba Ross change model, right? The interesting thing about the Kuba Ross change model is that, that the leaders who were in the know prior to an event happening always have greater buoyancy of getting back on the horse and running along with it. The same is true for innovation at a macro level. Uh, in most organizations, most countries, let me, let me, let me change the uh, story to countries. Most countries, most governments are not the first to bring about change. It is individuals at an entrepreneurship level that lead changes. Much like the Czech Guavaras of the world, much like all the all the uh, historical figures that you that you would go back to, they're almost at some level. If they're if not entrepreneur, they might have been activists. Just just check history. They would have done something to lead uh, an inner change or an inner uh, or, or you know or or a peace in society that they did not agree that they were looking to change that. Over a period of time, after the first wave is done with entrepreneurs, early entrepreneurs, then the second wave happens. After the, after the Amazons of the world are done, after the flip cards of the world are done, after all of that is done, then finally at the third level, government takes over. And that is the power of macroeconomics. So the India government took the learnings from what entrepreneurs in the country were providing and turned it on its head. They brought the, the unified payment gateways, they brought the, the retail gateways, they brought a whole lot of technology to transform the way India does business, the, the common man does business. So it's not just for the Ambanis of the world or just for the Tatas of the world. They are aiding a great deal to, to you know, to our nation of 1.4 billion people. But look what they are doing at the banking level. The HDFC bank and HDFC mergers, that is how values are now getting created without getting into distress sales, like we saw at the beginning of this year. Those are, those are mergers and acquisitions, but in unhealthy states, going back to collaboration, that's the way we all grow. But imagine when then this is done intentionally in a powerful way, then how much change, how much innovation, and what kind of culture we are breathing in day in and day out. So that's about the government piece that, that uh, I was uh, very moved to pick up on what you said. <laughs> being <laughs> comments, uh, Raghav, you should be commenting. Being inside the government, I totally, totally, totally agree with that. Governments, uh, well, there's two things about innovation. You know, no matter what organization you're in, whether it's a private entity or a government, and you can have the brightest people innovating. But if that innovation doesn't go anywhere, nobody takes that and uses it, people will eventually give up. Government is not a place where they'll take any innovation. They are so conservative, they cannot even try anything new. So, so that kills that culture of innovation right, uh, right there in, in government. That hierarchy, you know, the levels of uh, approval that you need to get to even make a little change will kill all of their innovation. But governments are getting smarter. Yeah. Well, governments are saying, we can't do it internally. Well, no, we can't take that risk. But what we'll do is, we will entice you, we'll give you money, we'll provide you resources, we'll provide you mentorship, we'll provide you connections. So you're able to do that innovation. But I want you to go and trial it on some other guinea pig. You know, go and trial it in you know, other organizations. Uh, that are willing to take the risk, and if something goes wrong, they're still going to be fine because they'll have backup plans. And once you've proven that five times, come to us, and we'll consume that, we'll buy that. So the governments are getting smart by actually, and that's the department that I was leading, was basically going out there, you know, fostering, you know, creating 
those innovation capabilities that eventually, you know, we were buying those technologies back so the government was getting, you know, ahead of the game. So yeah. that, that's, where, that's where I think the world is going. I mean, these are very f fantastic points that I think we don't really think about intentionally, we see it. But I think it's, it's, it's good for us to be aware of it, correct? From a perspective of, hey, this is the change that's happening and this is how yeah. innovation is being led. Um, so just moving a slightly a little different, what are we doing to enable this in the next generation? I mean, we've, here we have like three generation of us <laughs> being through technology, but uh, you know, how are we taking it to the next level? Because I was on a panel with David, and like he just can't stop coding. Like he just finished his panel and he's sitting there to code. So how are we kind of encouraging that kind of a mindset? And how are we kind of you know, accepting what their needs are? Because when we innovated, it was problem solving, correct? But for them, it's, it's, there's an excitement of innovation. Um, you know, beyond uh, just solving a problem, but it's about community-based, uh, adding value. Because if I look at the next generation, I look at my own children, um, the innovation has to be tied to something that's of a value, correct? Yeah. How is it returning back value to the community, to the, you know, to a broader set of people? So how would you find kind of things, what are we doing to enable that? You know, what mechanisms are we doing? Well, I, as, a, as the senior on this panel, will uh, <laughs> will start the conversation. Is you know, I think we've made uh, made uh, made the world a much better place for people to innovate. Uh, you know, look back uh, 45, 50 years ago when I uh, you know first started. For me to create anything or even create a small enterprise, uh, you know, to buy a, a computer system at that time would uh, you know half a million dollars. It'd be very difficult. I mean, just that, right? So the capital ex uh, expenditure to to do something, even to trial it out, uh, you know, prohibited a lot of people not doing anything. Today, you'll see somebody out there sitting there creating uh, 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 an application or something that he'll be able to sell tonight. And in two weeks, there'll be a company registered and you'll have 500 uh, customers and continue. So we've made the technologies in this world, the innovation for the last 50 years have made it so easy for people to innovate. So I'm just gonna pass the baton to you so you can then pass it on to Richira. <laughs> I think from my side, uh, what I have seen is uh, organizations that are willing to again take the bet, are willing to break down bureaucracy, correct? You know, a flat leadership uh, where we don't have those approval processes that you're talking about. Uh, willing to say, hey, we are okay to try, willing to partner. Um, I think those are enablers, looking at it more holistically from a policy perspective, from a government funding perspective. Um, looking at uh, DEI, because I am a big proponent of being techno in bringing DEI into technology and very intentionally, correct? Um, because uh, when we talk about culture, like, you know, I've had uh, 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 regional teams, I've had uh, teams that I've managed globally, and I've seen that, you know, how if I were to take a, something, a problem to Asia Pac, how they would solve versus if I were to bring something here in uh, Americas, the different mindset that they had. But I think those barriers are breaking down now today. Um, you can see a more globalization. People are willing to listen. Um, there's more diversity, even when creating uh, tech solutions, correct? We are being inclusive in a lot of ways, intentionally. I think that inclusion, intentional inclusion is very important to kind of, to take the leap where we are today. Uh, we never said, you know, one solution solves all. Uh, but even like you're talking about AI, and I think that's where some of the complexities of regulations and things come, but we are willing to listen to it. We are willing to say, hey, that is the use case. We have to kind of address it. Uh, we can't say that, you know, we'll take one use case and you know, fit it into the retro. So I think the broadening of that mindset is also helping us from that aspect of it. Um, that is something that I'm seeing. Um, I'm also seeing next generation willing to take the plunge. Uh, they are much, uh, I guess, so we've provided a background for them to say, uh, you know, it's okay to fail. They are not, um, you know, they're not scrutinized for failures. Like if all of us, like we were coming from India and most of us were either engineers or doctors, we now have a broader spectrum. Hey, you can be an artist and still do technology, correct? Yeah. So I think there's a change in paradigm shift of what we are trying to do. And I think those also encourage, um, you know, cultural, um, innovations uh, in a lot of ways. Because artists today, as we were talking about, you know, you don't have to learn music, you don't have to go to music school, yeah. but you can still be a singer, you have, you know, media compared to that, where you can record, you can play it, um, you can have somebody sitting across 
continents and partnering with you in that collaboration, correct? So I think those are things that we're doing. Yes, sir. I thought you raised your hand. Uh, empowering next generation. I think the biggest thing I would say is spontaneity. Uh, just as saying uh, no is our right, so is uh, saying yes. So as leaders, and I, I don't necessarily mean when I say leader, I don't necessarily mean to say having a title or a designation that vows, vows the family and friends network. Not in that sense, but I think everybody is a leader because they have to lead themselves. So spontaneity, keeping spontaneity alive. Second thing is about what are we knowing, having the awareness of what we are saying no to as leaders. And what are we saying yes to? Because behind every no, there is a hidden yes. So trying to find the yes in the no's and how much of the no that we say often, how much of it represents our hidden fears. So if we raise a generation to be more self-reflective, if we raise a generation to be a lot more aware, if we raise a conscientious generation a generation that has moral values that they live from, that is aligned to what they are doing, aligned to not just responsibilities or, or just be affiliated with roles because I have to be a breadwinner or I am a man or a woman and, and there are X, Y, Z things that I'm supposed to do. Beyond that, what is the moral imperatives that we are giving our next generation would be vital in the way they uh, make human connections whether uh, that's with their suppliers, whether it is with their bosses, whether it's with their peers, whether they are reaching out to folks from across the nation, what kind of groups and activities that they indulge in. All of those would be defining of what kind of uh, companies and what kind of uh, innovation that you see coming out from companies tomorrow. So that would be my submission. Thank you, Sai. Good. Um, we've got about eight minutes. Any questions we can take from the audience? Yes, sir. Uh, sure, please go ahead. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for the great panel, great discussion. I, I was just, I'm looking at the name of the talk. Uh, it's uh, Fostering Early Adoption Mindsets. And um, I, I just had a, a question about that because I'm an early adopter personally my organization, I run a marketing company, but we're not early adopters as an organization because of the risk, right? Um, we prefer to let others kind of perfect things and then when, it's, when we feel that it's ready for prime time, we use it. So this premise of fostering early adoption mindsets, it seems to suggest that everybody should be an early adopter, but everybody can't be, right? Because if everybody was an early adopter, there'd be no early adopters. It, uh, so, but my question for you then is, who should be an early adopter? Should everybody be, or should some people be, or companies? And how do you know whether you should be an early adopter or not? I'll, I'll take it and I'll pass it to my panelists. So I think from my perspective, what I've seen is anyone can be an early adopter. Uh, but where you play the pros and cons are based on what you're talking about, your risk and what do you have as a backing, correct? So if you have a primary product that is already making the ROI for you, uh, you know, you are play you're in a good place to kind of try maybe something new, to get into that space of being the early adopter, because that could probably, you know, help you to be one of those leaders who are trying to take the plunge. Um, there could be other things that you could probably try would be if you're partnering, like we were talking about, you know, partnering with from a business perspective as such, as in that, you know, can you all partner and kind of come up with a solution that is, can make both of you all winner rather than there's just one winner. That's another aspect of strategy that you can probably think about. The other thing is look at what somebody else has done. Use the failures that we were talking about, correct? Maybe taking those failures and making it your success. So you don't have to kind of do everything ground up, but you know, take what makes sense to you and build upon that. 
that even that would give you a leap forward rather than starting it from you know ground up and maybe having to fail repeat those failures make the same mistakes so i think that's another way to look at it so i think there are many ways to become early adopters and how you can kind of propel that in your own context that would be my you know take but i will look to my panelists to say what else they have. Uh, absolutely i think every organization uh, should be early adopters but but then you need to uh, you need to weigh the risks of uh, the different things they are mission critical things that uh, you're going to do obviously you're not going to be an early adopter for any of that but you may on a on a on a different level or in a, on on the side to trial so it does not affect your business if something doesn't work but uh, a lot of areas where you, you know the risks is low i think those are areas that uh, that you want to be an early adopter so i think every organization has a lot of opportunities to be an early adopter so you have to have that open mindset that uh, you know you are willing to take some risks but in areas that is not if something goes wrong if the product that you uh, you know uh, adopting and uh, taking an early adoption that doesn't work for some reason or fails that it does not you know have a catastrophic uh, impact on the business so just need to have weigh the risk i'll just add one more if i give it to you um i th i think capital one has got a good example they have something called the garage where they actually play features that they bring into the market and in that they bring the community together so if you go to capital one and if you are at, at any of the offices they have a place where they actually give you all that's like your puzzle like your lego set so they put a lot of things there you can pick and choose and as a community player you can go and play and test their features and there is somebody watching and seeing how you kind of use those features and how do you kind of make use of those um you know attributes that they have given there it could be an asset it could be a crayon it could be a pencil it could be just a board it could be two applications that they are trying to test it could be anything but that's another way of how you can get into early adoption because you're engaging the community there so you know they actually take community help there to say hey does this fly or not um and and they have had some you know very good because they have your their um their program their application that they that you can plug and play with your uh, browsers which actually saves money but that initially was something that they launched with community which eventually now is like you know it's recommended that you do it and they compete against amazon for that instance like you know to save money so i think it's it's just being creative i think that's how you should be thinking about it do you need any more inputs <laughs> 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 any other questions we've got 3 minutes um, so do you have any last words before we close the panel um I think one thing that's important about uh, early adoption is that one knows that it opens up it opens up venues it opens up pathways it need not be the complete map and neither does it need to be the complete territory so spontaneity that i previously spoke about it allows for curiosity of the human mind to continue for the exploration to continue so it's not always as an early adopter that you are picking up the tool sets or the tools can you hear me yeah yeah cool so it's not always in the tools that you are adopting it is also to to get a feel of where the world is going where they are wanting to swim are they wanting to swim against the tides or or is there a, is this a new current that is coming through and what's in it for you one important piece to always remember is that we are talking from a place of value and impact impact and value and we are interchanging those words the truth of the matter is nobody for knows for sure ultimately what gets created as values subjective value or real value nobody knows so you have to allow it some chance and you cannot always wait for someone else to take a chance on you so fostering an adoption mindset really is about you taking chance on things that you believe in and giving it some space just that much some space beautifully said 
I, I think if you're an entrepreneur in this, uh, in this room and you're going back, I think you need to kind of think about uh, the benefits of early adoption of technology or innovation, how it can really propel your excel your business. And I talked about those kind of things, you know, competitive, bottom line, you know, retention and stuff like that. If you, uh, so make, making sure that you go in and start to create that culture of taking a bit of risk in a planned way. And if you're, uh, if you're working for somebody, is, uh, you know, this is a great opportunity to go back and, and start to uh, you know, help the organization start to think about early adoption, you know, thinking out of the box and uh, you know, fostering a, a, a culture of innovation within, uh, within your organization. And a lot of things that we talked about today, a lot of different ideas you can put to the table and uh, you know, hacking and all that kind of stuff. And uh, hopefully that will definitely help and make your company competitive, which uh, you know, makes uh, your um, you know, job better and secure as well. Thank you. So I think from my side, I would just say it's um, take a chance as well as say take the path, untra the road untraveled. Um, it'll open up many doors. It may not be the door you wanted to open, but it will definitely open opportunities. So thank you, everyone. Thanks to the audience. Thanks to the panelists. Thank you. <laughs> Raghav as well as uh, Ruchira. It was wonderful sharing the stage with you. Thank you Same so much. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you.